We're going to be diving into issues of uh, adult patient perspective on uh, living with pancreatitis. And we're gonna kick that off with a panel discussion. Uh, on this panel, uh, we have uh, June, Adriana, Eric, and Hillary, who are gonna be sharing both their experiences um, and, and preferences for treatment. And I'll ask Jane to get us started today. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you just heard, my name is Jane Holt, and I'm a patient with chronic pancreatitis. As most of you know, our journey, our story really starts with a diagnosis. The beginning is more of a journey. My journey began in early January 1988. I was at home asleep. My hus husband and four children were in the house with me. I woke up in the middle of the night in excruciating pain. It felt as though my insides were exploding. I knew immediately there was something terribly wrong and I needed to go to the hospital. I had to drive myself and leave my husband at home with our younger children. There was a classic New England snowstorm going on, but luckily the hospital was, was not very far away. After blood work and an ultrasound, I was diagnosed with possible gallstones. They gave me heavy pain medication, set me up for an appointment with a surgeon, and sent me home. Now remember, I was alone. It was 4 a.m. in the morning, and it was snowing heavily. <laughs> they let me go out and drive my car home, but luckily, I made it home safely. Um, 10 days later, my gallbladder was removed. Things were different then, and I stayed overnight in the hospital. The next morning, the surgeon came to visit me. I remember so clearly telling him that I had some pain from the surgery, but the original pain was still there. Many of us have had our gallbladder removed and the pain returns. I went back to the surgeon two weeks later still in pain. He prescribed statins and suggested I follow up with my GP. I did this for several months, but continued to have the pain. But I was pretty lucky. I lived in Boston. Um, I had friends that knew people in the, in the best hospitals, and I was able to get an appointment um, with a gastroenterologist at B.I. Deaconess Hospital in Boston in October of 1988. After doing a medical history and blood work, my doctor said he thought I had pancreatitis. I had an ERCP that confirmed this diagnosis. Finally, I had a cause for the pain, and it only took several months to be diagnosed instead of years for some of the patients. In November, I had major surgery to open the ducts to my pancreas, and the journey continued. In the very beginning, my major symptoms were pain and nausea. I was always tired. My children were five, nine, and I had twins that were 11. Uh, they were my life, and I still tried to do everything for them, but it became very difficult. The surgery held for a few months, but the pain returned. There was no treatment for pancreatitis. When the pain became intolerable, I had to be hospitalized. I would be NPO and put on IV fluids and heavy pain medication. Early on, I couldn't go home until I could eat solid food. I was hospitalized at least four times a year and sometimes more. There was one year where I spent the entire month of June in the hospital. Every time I advanced to food, the excruciating pain would return. My youngest son spent a whole day in the hospital visiting me because it was his birthday. We went downstairs for lunch in the cafeteria, a trip to the gift store. After school, the family came in and we had a birthday party with birthday cake. It totally exhausted me, but I had to be with my son on his birthday. My symptoms would improve after hospitalizations. My pain level would sometimes be as low as three. I stayed on my very low fat diet. I never drank alcohol and I took my enzymes. I never cheated because it wasn't worth it. I learned very early that if I ate too much fat within 45 minutes to an hour, I would be in pain. I had nausea medication that I could take when I was vomiting that helped sometimes. I was always hospitalized in the fall, and I never quite figured out why. At first, I thought it was the stress of getting the kids back to school and back to a regular schedule after a very relaxing summer. But my, now I realize my, my attacks had nothing to do with stress. To this day, my pancreas always flares in the fall. As time went on, I was hospitalized less. The surgeons put in ports so I could have TPN at home. To begin with, I had a big IV pole at home. It would take 10 hours every night to infuse the TPN. I have pictures of Christmas morning with me and my pole, enjoying the gifts that Santa Claus brought the children. Later, I was able to use a backpack, which made me much more mobile. The kids were getting older, so it meant that I could go to school plays and concerts and sporting events hooked up to my TPN. Then I had problems with the port. I developed blood clots, and then one time when I was in the hospital, I developed sepsis, which was from an infection in the line. 
The port was removed, and after that, when I went home, I had to have a pick line. Luckily, I've been off TPN for about 10 years. I've never used pain medication on a regular basis. It was only when I had flare-ups, but can, but can go for long periods of time when I don't need it. I can always feel my pancreas. I always have a mild pain, at least. I can feel it always, right here. My times of very bad pain have been less in the last six years, and I've been hospitalized less. I've had a few ERCPs, many MRCPs, CAT scans, ultrasounds, and thousands and thousands of blood tests. I've traveled to Mayo Clinic, Leahy Clinic, George Washington Hospital for second opinions. My doctors has brought my records to many medical meetings for input from other physicians. Over the last 32 years, I've done everything I can to try to fix this disease or at least find out more about it. For most, patient, pa for most patients, treatments haven't changed. It's now even getting harder to get one of the things that can help the most, which is pain medication. I hope this meeting is the beginning of a change. We can't ignore patients like me. We have to do something to make a difference for all of our patients. Good morning, my name is Adriana Lamas Cowden. I'm a 43 year old married woman from Indianapolis, Indiana. My struggle with chronic pancreatitis started in 2015. I had recently relocated to Indianapolis to take a new job as a chief marketing officer and had just started to date a man that would later become my husband. To say I was excited about the future was an understatement. I was in a new city with a new job, a new relationship, and a new home, and I was just doing it all. And then I took a sip of a water. Nothing fancy like Pellegrino, just some tap water. And I doubled over into the worst pain of my life. My assistant came running into my office and immediately called the emergency room to have me taken over. They initially thought it was my gallbladder, so that was removed. They were wrong. It was an acute pancreatitis attack. That cleared up and I went back to work. Two weeks later, it happened again, only this time it was a sip of coffee. Back to the ER and back into the hospital, I was admitted this time for three weeks. Forget dinner and a movie, our new dates were to the ER and our movie nights were bedside as I laid in the hospital and learned about lipase, amylase, and feeding tubes. Between 2015 and 2016, I underwent 17 procedures to stop the pain, calm the nausea, provide organ rest, and help diagnose why my pancreas had decided to flare up on a regular basis. I was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic divism and was living on and off feeding tubes. We tried as many variations of medications possible, and I'd learned how to live on Creon, a digestive enzyme that can cost a small fortune. In this time, I spent a total of six months in the hospital, lost my new job, my new home, and my livelihood. I regularly lived on strong narcotics for the pain. My now fiance's father passed away unexpectedly in November of 2016. We flew to the remote part of Nebraska for the funeral, and halfway through the funeral, I had to find a quiet corner. A severe attack came on and I was crumbling into a doubled over pain on the floor. I was in a ball whimpering and I thought, why now? Why when he needs me most is my body failing me? We called my doctors and they asked how fast I could get to a hospital. The nearest hospital was two hours away and they didn't even have an MRI machine. The next morning we packed up and flew to Chicago where my new medical team was and I was admitted to the University of Chicago Medical Center. Two days later, I was told I had to have the Whipple procedure or I would die. I asked how long I had to make the decision, and they told me they had surgery date available on December 15th. They released me to spend Thanksgiving with my family, and on December 15th, I went into surgery for nine hours. They removed half my pancreas, just over half my stomach, most of my small intestine, and my bile duct. I spent three weeks in the hospital with infections, complications, and was released home with three drains and a wound vac. It took me 12 months to recover from the Whipple. In those 12 months, I was on over 20 medications daily and back on a feeding tube. I had cared for 24 seven for four months as I couldn't bathe, dress, or feed myself and I was wheelchair bound. It was painful, humiliating, and disabling. And for some reason, the Whipple wasn't taking. I was still getting flares with debilitating pain awful nausea and vomiting, and more long stays in the hospital with nothing but fluids to allow for organ rest. I'd lost my career, many of my friends, and I was down to 86 pounds. By the grace room above, my fiance stood by me and we were married. He spent every night that I was hospitalized next to me, 
sleeping, eating, and bathing in the hospital and being my best advocate. By 2019, I'd had 16 ERCPs, which many CP patients have one or two, and my pancreatic specialist said I was no longer a viable candidate for additional endoscopic procedures. My pancreas had a stone, a full blockage in the duct, and I had a hernia. I was taking narcotics four times a day, three types of nausea med medications, and spending most of my days in bed. Things had to change. November 14th of 2019, I had a total pancreatectomy auto islet transplant surgery. During a 14-hour surgery, they removed my pancreas, harvested islet cells, which produce insulin in your body, and transplanted them into my liver. This highly skilled surgery was done with five surgical teams and was my last option. I came out of surgery and was in ICU for three days and then on a transplant floor for four days. Seven days after surgery, I was released from the hospital. I'm now 90 days out from surgery and pain-free and work out four days a week and I'm off all narcotics. So I wouldn't say life is perfect, but in my mind, it's as close as it can be. And that said, I'm an insulin-dependent diabetic I fight some low sugars and was almost hospitalized once for that. I still take Creon for digestion and I'm living on nausea meds four times a day, but I have my life back. And I'm looking forward to working again, enjoying real dates with my husband outside of the hospital, traveling and spending time with my family. And I would say that this disease can rob you of your entire life, but with the right medications and care, you can absolutely get it back. Good morning. My name's Eric Golden. I'm 51 years old and live in Santa Monica, California with my wife and three children. I was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis in 2012 after becoming gravely ill, essentially becoming bedridden for long stretches, and after being misdiagnosed with diverticulitis for almost five years. To give you some perspective, before my symptoms became unbearable, I had essentially no patience for being sick. I once almost went six years without a sick day at work and simply pushed through the illnesses that would send most people home. It is impossible to do so with chronic pancreatitis. Through genetic testing, I learned I have two CFTR mutations and one CASR mutation that my doctors believe are the primary cause of the disease. I never smoked, I was not a heavy drinker, and I've had basically zero alcohol since my diagnosis. But I encounter people all the time, including physicians, who assume that people with this disease must be alcoholics. I consider myself one of the lucky ones with this disease. I have a wonderful, supportive family. I'm able to be well-informed, serving on the board of several nonprofits involved with pancreatic disease. I am rarely hospitalized. Many people with this disease, including many you will hear from today, have it much worse. But I want to tell you what being one of the lucky ones means with chronic pancreatitis. I am in pain virtually every day. At its worst, which is several times a week, it is simply the most intense pain you have ever experienced. The best analogy is feeling as if acid has been poured into your intestines, or you've been stabbed by a flaming hot knife. I've had severe shoulder dislocations, broken bones, and plenty of other painful mishaps, and none of them come close to this pain. You cannot fall asleep in that much pain, and getting to sleep often takes hours and a combination of pain medication and sleep aids. Fatigue affects me nearly every day. For months at a time, I feel I'm at maybe 50% or less of my old energy level, affecting nearly all aspects of my daily life. While I am too stubborn to stop working, many days I fight to make it to the end of the workday. When I get home, often I am done, in bed and not able to be the parent or husband I would like to be. When you feel this way for a long time, it is difficult not to experience at least some hopelessness and depression. The flare-ups are the worst parts. At those points, I am not at 50%, I am at 5%, much worse than, say, having the flu. I'm drained of all energy, nauseous, weak, bedridden, barely able to function, in horrible pain, and unable to eat any solid food for up to five days at a time. If you had not experienced this before, you would take yourself to the emergency room right away, since you feel that your body is simply shutting down. Sometimes these flare-ups are months apart, but other times they are weeks apart. It takes up to two weeks to recover from a flare-up, so that means being debilitated for large parts of your life. The things that can cause a flare-up 
include a single inadvertent high fat meal, intense exercise, stress, working too hard, travel, or sometimes there is no discernible cause. If you, if you do not constantly practice very good self care, you can be very sick most, much of the time. And even with constant vigilance, you suffer almost daily. For years, I was on daily oxycodone. While I tried constantly to manage my dose, it increased over time just to have the same effectiveness. This fall, I decided to stop daily opioid use. With the help of the Stanford Pain Clinic, I reduced my dose from 15 milligrams to zero over the course of 75 days. This was exceedingly challenging, and I'm concerned whether most people could do this without very serious help. I will say that it would be dangerous and cruel for physicians to cut off patients without a very gradual taper, but I hear about this all the time in the pancreatitis community. In some ways, I feel better without opioids. My energy level seems higher, and I have had fewer flare-ups, though I cannot say whether this is causation or coincidence. But the medication I've been giving as a substitute, including gabapentin and clonidine, rarely comes close to stopping the pain. And many nights, I'm in too much pain to fall asleep without a sleep aid like Ambien. Because of this, opioids remain an essential daily need for many patients. Two things that have been effective for me, not to sound like a stereotypical Californian, have been meditation and cannabis. For cannabis, I take equal parts CBD and THC. I've meditated seriously for two years, and while it does not reduce symptoms, it can allow you to approach your condition with equanimity rather than hopelessness. Cannabis for me does not reduce the pain, but ma makes it much easier to bear. I would urge this body to, give, to take cannabis very seriously as a treatment for conditions like this, and to give very serious consideration to newer treatments like psilocybin, which I know from clinical trials has helped patients with terminal cancer cope with depression and hopelessness. But I want to stress that none of this is enough right now. This is a degenerative disease that will get worse with dangerous complications, not all of which are well understood. For example, a laparoscopic procedure found extensive adhesions in my abdomen. And one of the nonprofits I work with, Mission Cure, subsequently learned that a large proportion of patients receiving the TPIAT procedure also have adhesions, presumably from the constant inflammation. I believe these adhesions exacerbate digestive problems for me since they can contort or constrict my intestines. And in terms of life impact, this disease can be devastating. I cannot imagine how patients with more severe pancreatitis are able to make it through the day. And I am heartbroken to think that any child should have to go through such intense pain and suffering. But as you will hear from the next panel, many of them do. It is essential that an effective treatment be found for this debilitating, costly disease. I thank the FDA for its interest and attention and am available to provide any additional information that would be helpful. Good morning. My name is Hillary Mendelson, and I'm 54 years old. I'm a Los Angeles native. I have four kids, three in college, and one recent graduate. And I'm a very happy newlywed. I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in February of 2002 at the age of 36. I had been experiencing a dull, persistent ache in the middle of my back, being caused by a large tumor on the head of my pancreas. I had a Whipple procedure 10 days after diagnosis. The surgery was difficult, and only three of four margins were clear. One still showed cancer cells. Post-surgery, I had complications and infections, which were supposed to take my life. After several months of hospitalization, home nursing, and the challenge of reintegrating solid food, I began to try and regain my strength. At 92 pounds, two small children, and a marriage ending, I was a daughter, a single parent, a breadwinner, an entrepreneur, and a cancer survivor. When I was diagnosed, my doctor gave me the odds, 60 to 90 days without surgery, and best case, 10 to 24 months with surgery based upon the type of my cancer and the size of my tumor. No matter the odds or the facts, I was determined to be the one to survive. I had too much to live for, but my journey wouldn't be an easy one. My motto became whatever it takes. 
I began to gain weight slowly, but I now had new adjustments. I had dietary restrictions due to my streamlined digestive system. And as I would soon learn, if I ate something that didn't work, it wasn't just a stomach ache, but acute pancreatitis would ensue. Over the last 16 years, I've had eight surgeries related to my pancreas, seen doctors all over the country, as well as in Canada and Germany, and endured more pain than anyone should have to know. But I have lived each day to the fullest and made the most of my good days and figured out how to reduce my bad days and even figured out how to better endure those bad days. When I would ask medical professionals about pancreatitis, they would always discuss it related to alcoholism, smoking, obesity, or diabetes. As a competitive gymnast from the age of seven through college, I was never a drinker, never smoked cigarettes or used drugs, never overweight, lived a clean and healthy life, and had no family history of pancreatic cancer or pancreatitis. The first attack of acute pancreatitis, I thought I was having a heart attack and went to the emergency room. No one had told me this was a potential side effect of pancreatic cancer. I was hospitalized and put on morphine, drip, and NPO for a week. After experiencing episodes of acute pancreatitis, most medical professionals I encountered assumed it was alcohol-related before I told them about my medical history. It is so frustrating to be admitted to a hospital and have most assume that I'm there with pancreatitis because of my own, a consequence of my own hard living. And even when they do know the reason that I'm afflicted with this painful, disruptive, and destructive condition, many tell me there is very little I can do. I sometimes wish they could feel the pain just for a brief moment, so at least empathy could enter the equation. Acute pancreatitis interrupts, makes you accommodate, and changes day-to-day -day life. It sets parameters on your life and affects those around you. When you combine that with being a pancreatic cancer survivor, things get even more complicated. Travel is part of my work, and I have to figure out how to have what I need when I'm on the road. A restrictive diet means I go to the market, so I have things I know I can eat. The hotel room I stay in must have a bathtub. I need to make sure I have a surplus of medications that I need, which stay with me in my backpack at all times and never in check luggage. I'm traveling alone, driving hundreds of miles a day, so I must be self-aware of how I'm feeling at all times so that I can be safe and sensible should I feel an episode of acute pancreatitis coming on. I've learned to deal with the last decade of acute pancreatitis episodes on my own, without pain medication, IVs, or hospitals. Over the past few years, my, with my streamlined digestive system, my liver is now overworked and underpaid and has begun to show signs of atrophy. Since then, I've made further accommodations, knowing that there isn't someone like me who's had a liver transplant and trying to protect what I have. I have had many doctors and medical professionals tell me variations of, I can't help you with your, issue, with your issues, but frankly, you're just lucky to have al been alive this long. Quality of life is the most important thing to me. Knowing I must accommodate to so many things others don't have to think about is challenging enough. Dealing with the pain of acute pancreatitis should be the most difficult part. Not negotiating with doctors and medical professionals to help me and not dismiss me. Luck is the smallest factor of my existence in the face of difficult odds. I have fought to be here, endured much pain, and conquered fear. I have looked for answers where others said there were none. I have listened to my body, learned about physiology, and come up with my own set of answers, truths, tricks, and methods. Knowing quality of life is the most paramount issue. Even with all of my struggle, I'm thankful to have a life to live. To that end, I'm hopeful and prepared to work towards making sure that more is learned and more can be done. Other than my beautiful family, I hope my legacy is to be part of the change, encouraging compassionate care 
and inspiring innovation in pancreatic studies and helping those afflicted find more daily quality of life. Wow, it's uh, incredibly brave to get up and speak first in front of everyone. So I just would like to ask everyone to join me in another round of applause for the whole panel. So now we're going to build on what we just heard from the excellent panel uh, through some intermixed polling questions with audience discussion. Um, so if you can go ahead and pull out your phones again, um, we're going to ask our patients and caregivers in the room uh, to answer a few questions, and then we're going to dig a little deeper with some uh, facilitated dialogue. So if we can have our first topic one question. So here, uh, we'd like to know which of the following pancreatitis-related health concerns that you uh, or your child have had, recently have had, and please check all that apply. Um, I should note that for this set of polling questions, um, even if you're here for, uh, to represent a pediatric patient, we would like you to respond to those at this time. Um, these are going to be the polling questions that we'll use uh, for the full group today. So which of the following uh, health concerns do you or your child have or have recently had? Um, the options are A, pain, B, nausea or lack of appetite, C, fatigue, D, abnormal bowel movements, E, weight loss or malabsorption, F, bloating, G, dizziness, H, diet restrictions, I, thirst or dehydration, J, irritability, K, worry for the future, L, anxiety or depression, or M, some other health concern related to your pancreatitis that's not listed on this slide. Again, please check all that apply. So I think there might be a question about the percentages. Is that what it is? Yes. So this is uh, not a, proportion, a percentage of patients and caregivers that are responding. It's a percentage of the total responses. Um, so what's important is to look at the relative weighting um, of the different responses. Um, it's just the way that the polling system displays it. We're able to actually look at the total percentage of everybody for each on the back end. But that's a great question. So while final results are trickling in, uh, it looks like um, the pancreatitis-related health concern that um, has been experienced uh, most by our participants today is pain, closely followed, uh, I would say, by a cluster of nausea and lack of appetite, uh, fatigue, abnormal bowel movements, and worry for the future. However, there's quite a bit of experience across every single other uh, health concern perhaps dizzy, dizziness being um, one of the ones that's less frequently experienced. Um, and there's a good amount of experience with other health concerns. So we'll, uh, as we go to the audience discussion, definitely want to hear about what those other health concerns are. Can we go to the second question? So here we want you to, uh, the previous question we asked about all of the uh, health uh, concerns that you have. And it was quite a great burden across many, almost every, actually every single one of the ones listed. Here we want you to pick the top three health concerns that you have. Um, your options are A, pain, B, nausea or lack of appetite, C, fatigue, D, abnormal bowel movements, E, weight loss or malabsorption, F, bloating, G, dizziness, H, the diet restrictions, I, thirst or dehydration, J, irritability, K, worry for the future, L, anxiety or depression, or M, one of your top three pancreatitis health-related concerns is something not listed on this slide. So please select uh, your top three.
So I'll give you just a few more moments to get your responses in. It looks like pain uh, is by and large the uh, uh, top, top three uh, pancreatitis related health concern uh, that those represented today have. Um, a little bit distant behind that are nausea and lack of appetite, worry for the future and fatigue. However, individuals did pick every other response uh, option except for dizziness, not falling in anyone's top three. And again, a number of other health concerns that aren't listed on this slide being top three. Um, so certainly we'll wanna hear about those. And if we'll do one more polling question at this point. So here uh, we've asked about the, the direct health concerns and now we wanna get a sense of what uh, the impacts are on activities in your daily life. So what specific activities of daily life are most important to you that you are not able to do when experiencing your pancreatitis? Please select your top three. Your options are walking, exercising, participation in sports and activities, social interaction and participation, attending school or having a job, or F, some other activity in your daily life that's important to you that you're not able to do uh, because of your pancreatitis. So it looks like uh, the top two responses that have been flipping a little bit have been social interaction and participation and attending school or having a job. So we'll definitely wanna hear your experiences and what has made it so that you're not able to do those. Um, next, kind of together, are exercising and participating in sports or activities, so physical activities, uh, more rigorous physical activities. Um, but uh, some of you, noted a top three uh, impact is an impact on not being able to even walk. Um, and then there's other activities that were listed uh, or that were not listed that you report not being able to do that are a top activity you're not able to do. So we'll wanna hear about that. Um, so that, let's turn it to you in the audience um, to talk about the direct health concerns related to your pancreatitis. Um, and so let's maybe start, we heard that the top um, concern is pain. Um, following that, it was nausea, uh, but there were others like fatigue. And then we heard, um, although not listed explicitly, um, that there's, you have attacks and flare-ups that happen. We heard that from the panel. Um, so we'd like to hear about what is maybe your top one or two uh, health concerns and tell us why it is that you view that as a top health concern. Yes. And just remember, please say your name. Before you Hello. Speak. My name is Carolyn Bloom, and I am 72 years old, probably older than anyone up there in the panel. Um, I was born, although I didn't know it, um, with uh, pancreas divism. So from the age of zero to 22, I was told I had the flu, I was nervous, uh, I was put on Valium in college, I had an ulcer, but at 22 I was um, diagnosed in Boston as having pancreatitis. So from 22 to 50, I could do my job, but uh, I was in the hospital seven times. Then when I was uh, 47, I had a stent put in by uh, a noted person, and the day after the stent went in, I was in horrendous pain. The noted person had left town, and uh, they would not take the stent out. So I had to be in pain like having a knife in me for two weeks, and after that, it turned out that the stent, because we're talking about um, quite a while ago, 1997, um, the stent had slipped and made my deformity even more deformed, so I became chronic. So from the years 19, from the time 1997 to, two, uh, actually earlier, 96 to 2008, I was in the hospital 250 times. I had 60 
two ERCPs, which I have since found out was a horrible thing to do. You shouldn't have more than two or three. And I was in the hospital the average of about eight months out of 12 months a year for 13 years. So I would say that uh, I'm very knowledgeable on this topic. And then in, uh, I was ready to kill myself, actually. I was on dilated fentanyl ketamine. They told me I couldn't have any more ERCPs and there was no more pain medicine. And so that's when I found the hotline. Thank God it used to be on yahoo.com. It's now on Facebook. And I found out the, how I went to every major medical center in this country every single one, Mass General, Johns Hopkins, Mayo, I won't go into the rest. But then I heard about the one place in the country that did do this TPAIT, and so in 2008, I had it, and uh, it was my only choice, even though every institution poo-pooed it. And now, every one of the institutions, including the doctors in this room today, Everyone poo-pooed it. They said, you shouldn't do it. It's experimental, and you'll become a type 1 diabetic, which I am. But who cares? I mean, I am here now, 12 years later. Probably the, I was told that I and one other person, I was told by this, are the oldest living survivors of the TP and the AIT, and I am probably one of the oldest living survivors of pancreatitis, period, being that I'm 72 and was born with it. So all I can say is that I do, if, if your pain gets really horrible, the TPAIT does stop the pain. I have learned the Whipple doesn't stop the pain, and some of the Whipple candidates can, are not candidates for the uh, TPAIT, but some are. And so all I can say is thank you to University of Minnesota, Dr. David Sutherland, who, fought, who created this, and Dr. Bellin, who was part of my team when I had this. And I have tried for years to be a spokesperson for this because I don't think anyone as old as I has gone through what I've gone to, but I have not been able to break through. But I am happy to talk to anyone because I really, unfortunately, know a lot. Yeah, so when uh, I have a, yes. just a follow-up question for yes. you. Um, so you talked about, I think it was age 47, where you, know, you had the stent and your pancreatitis became chronic. Um, could you kind of uh, c contrast for us a little bit the, you know, what was the driving sy symptoms and frequency of those symptoms before that time versus after? Um, the pain when you're acute, as many people said, you get a horrible attack. You're in the hospital for two weeks. Um, you don't eat anything, but you're lucky. An ice cube is a filet mignon. And then you live, <laughs> you live in a very bland, fat-free diet. But once I became chronic at 47, after the, I am against stenting, by the way, because of mine. And I've been told that, well, of course, I had my stent in the olden days. Now that they have uh, made the stenting more probably better, but I'm anti-stenting because I try to stent one other time and the same thing happened. But um, the, once you're chronic and become as chronic as I did, mm -hmm. uh, it's excruciating. Even when I, I was in the hospital eight months a year, I'd go home and I couldn't eat. I couldn't get out of bed. So then I'd end up back in the hospital eight months a year for 13 years is a long time in the hospital. Yes. And uh, I hope, I am so happy now that I hear that they are doing this surgery on people as young as five. And if only I had been alive in the period, because I lived most of my life in excruciating pain. Anyone have a question or? That's it? Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. You can just so who else would like to share about their top symptom or symptoms? Hi, my name is Holly Watson. Hi. I'm 34, and I have hereditary chronic pancreatitis. I was diagnosed when I was 21. I think I had my first attack that I remember that being what this was at about 19. Mm -hmm. 
And I was told when I was 21 at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, they were like, wow. And I was like, I know what it is. It's pancreatitis. And he's like, how do you know that? And I was like, my whole family has this since they were three years old. My cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my sister, my mother, just, I knew. And it, to me, at that moment was a death sentence because nobody knew what to do. They were like, we can't help you. And I was devastated. I mean, what do I do with that information? I'm 21. They tell you, don't drink alcohol, don't eat large meals, don't get stressed out. I'm like, you just named my life in a nutshell. Like, I don't have anyone to relate to. I have no one to talk to. The pain was ongoing for so long, and it started in my back. I thought I had, like, kidney problems, and I kept going for months and months trying to get them to fix my kidneys, and there was nothing there. And it came to a head, and I drove myself to the hospital, too. And now I'm 21 weeks pregnant with my third son, and all I can think of is my future or lack thereof. It's, to me, still... The only option I have is the TPAIT, potentially. I mean, if you're a candidate, which I would hope I am, but I haven't gone through that process. And that just sounds overwhelming to me. So anybody who has done that is a warrior, in my opinion. Good for you. It is terrifying, but it is life-saving. I'm not there yet. I think, God, every second of every day, I'm not in pain. But like some of them have said, a sip of water will put you into the hospital. How terrible is that? What am I supposed to do there? I went 36 weeks pregnant with my last pregnancy. And the ER admitting doctor was like, oh, you have pancreatitis and you're pregnant? I don't know what to do with you. I won't touch you. And literally walked out of the room. Great. Um, that I, <laughs> Hopelessness is one of my biggest symptoms, pain. But everyone's pain is different. I bring it up to GI doctors. I get... Uh, when I tell them dehydration is a big factor. If I get dehydrated even the slightest bit, it, it flares immediately. And he was like, well, that's interesting. I'm like, You've never heard that before? That's so scary. I started going to Hopkins. I started seeing a specialist. My hope for that is somebody, I won't have to go to the ER where doctors, I don't understand it, and I will have someone who has my back. Um, but that's, you know, that's a, a complicated relationship in and of itself. Uh, the pain is so scary to miss out on your kids' lives. They have three, four children up there, and I'm on my third, and I'll, I'm, do my kids have this gene? Am I going to be around for their birthday parties? Am I going to miss out on life? That's so scary to me, quality of life. I want to be there for my kids. That's my number one goal. If I'm in pain in a hospital or in bed, I'm missing it. Then what's the point? So my future, I need to have hope for the future. Treating the symptoms is not enough. The symptoms have long gone. My, my chance for pancreatic cancer is so sky high. It's more of a chance of when will it happen, not if, unless I get this radical surgery. It's radical. I mean, you tell some doctors that you don't have a pancreas, they, you can't live without a pancreas. Well, that's scary too. Yes, you can. I've seen it. <laughs> but I can't work with you if that's what you think. Or type 3 diabetes is what they call it. Well, that doesn't exist. Well, then I don't know what to call it, but if I don't have a pancreas to counteract the blood sugar highs and the pendulum sling of the lows, what do you want to call it? Name it something else, but that's scary. Especially in the middle of the night. Who's, I mean, if you're sleeping. All of these things are so scary to me, and it has been in my genes. Is it in my kids' DNA? I need hope for the future for them. My history is set. I'm going to get this TPAIT. I just don't know when, when someone can talk me into it, or my pain is on a daily basis, and it is worth it. You want to cut it out yourself at that point. So my hope is to be here and to do things like this, that we can start to get a dialogue going of the future hope for the generations, for the kids, for the next panel, for my kids. Not necessarily for me. I don't care so much about myself as much as I care about the future. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I do have a question for you. Sure. So I think you were so articulate about um, your worries for the future. Just to give us a little bit of grounding in your current experience, um, the one thing that you was noteworthy was you, know, you kind of had the onset of symptoms to the degree you knew it was the pancreatitis at age 19. You talked about the thing that maybe is the most common experience is flaring due to dehydration. You know, um, how often does that occur and how debilitating is that when you do experience it now? Um, I haven't had, luckily, a flare since I was 36 weeks pregnant about almost two years ago. Okay. And I'm one who, luckily, I kind of eat whatever I want. I take that. I'm going to eat all the things that I can now before it starts hurting. 
because a sip of water could do it mm -hmm. or it could be a cheeseburger i don't know or it could be the dehydration yeah. but the symptoms um and i only knew this was what it was because my family members had had it i didn't know really the symptoms since mine started in my back and nobody else had had that mm -hmm. um can you repeat your question one more time? Just, Make sure I'm going to answer it all the way. <laughs> just the, how often, you know, since age 19, have you had those types of oh, flares? I, oh, I've been to the hospital over 20 times, but I've had more flares than that. But knowing what it is and then going to the hospital, it's kind of like you've got to be so bad off to go to the hospital and try to explain yourself. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug seeker. Sure. Is it really worth it? So I've probably in all of those years, probably had over 45 flares, but gone to the hospital about 20 times. You self-medicate ibuprofen if you can, if you have something else. But opioids cause me to have pancreatitis. A lot of the medications they give me in the hospital have, it's the warning sign, it's in the, it's in the directions, it can cause pancreatitis, mm -hmm. yet they give it to you. And so that's scary, too. So it's part of me just wants to stay at home with all of that if you can. But it's more the dehydration. I need an IV. That's why I go. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Allie. Others? Yep. I'll step over here just a second. <laughs> sure. My name is Linda Martin, and I'm the mother of an adult daughter with uh, chronic pancreatitis. Um, and uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of her. She had hoped to be here, but uh, was not feeling well and decided not to get on a plane um, and make the trip. So I'll tell her story best I can. Um, it started really when she was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis in 2015. Um, she had a, a big job with an international company, had a whole team of uh, software developers and engineers working for her around the world. Um, was doing great in her career. Clients loved her and she loved her job. Was she sick more often than most people? Yes. Um, in retrospect, she had had a lot of stomach issues. Amy had been sick since a little girl. Um, we just all in the family said, oh, that's just Amy being Amy. Every time there was a big event, every time there was a big school event, whether it was Christmas, some other big family event or holiday, uh, excitement, stress, change of routine, all brought on what we called Amy's sensitive stomach. And uh, little do we know till 2015 that there was actually a name for this sensitive stomach that was accompanied by pain. Um, we, I took her to the doctor over and over again and it was constipation, acid stomach, sensitive stomach. Um, she just didn't want to go to school, which was my favorite excuse. Um, <laughs> and um, I would do the, oh, you don't have a fever, go to school. And um, I really underestimated the amount of pain and suffering that she was in as a child. Um, so fast forward to 2015, and the symptoms uh, got remarkably worse very quickly. She was sicker and sicker all the time, started missing more and more work. She could cover up for it for a while because she worked remotely from her house and was on, online with her team. But she was offered a big promotion to go to Toronto and head up uh, be a vice president of the company. She had to turn it down, and eventually they said, you know what, you seem to be missing a lot of work. We're gonna move on without you. And uh, from that day on, she has not been able to be gainfully employed. Um, continued to get sicker and sicker over the next few months, lost about 70 pounds. Um, my older daughter uh, went with her to a doctor's appointment and came back and called me and said, Mom, you have to do something about Amy. She is dying before our very eyes. And from that point, I dropped everything I was doing and we went from hospital to hospital, doctor to doctor, searching for somebody with answers. Eventually someone said, it's pancreatitis. Never had heard of pancreatitis, like a lot of people didn't exactly know what the pancreas did, but um, we, we soon learned it was pancreatitis, and um, one of the first visits after hearing the word pancreatitis, she was asked, have you ever had any alcohol? She said, um, well, I'm 40 years old, so yes, I have had some alcohol. I've never been a big drinker. Um, I don't drink a lot. I, in fact, for the last couple of years, I haven't had a drink because when I drink, it makes me really sick. And uh, so 
nonetheless, her medical chart to this day does say alcoholic pancreatitis. And uh, so uh, continued to search and search and search. In the meantime, she was getting sicker and sicker. And uh, on top of everything else, because of, in, in part because of the extreme and constant inflammation, she had uh, numerous um, cancer biomarkers that were elevated. So there was also a search and a lot of fear over does she have liver cancer, does she have colon cancer, does she have pancreatic cancer. She had tested positive for um, chronic amyloid leukemia, so had to go through bone marrow biopsy to rule out that she didn't actually have leukemia. Eventually, um, and her GI at a very uh, well-known institution said, don't worry, you're eating a low-fat diet you're doing everything you can do. There's nothing else we can do for you. Don't worry, your pancreas is actually healing itself. You just don't realize it. And uh, so um, by that point, she had done enough research. We had done enough research to learn that um, chronic pancreatitis does not heal itself. It is impossible to heal itself. Um, but little by little, she was saying, Mom, I'm not really vomiting very much anymore. I'm not vomiting food because I really can't eat food. I'm only vomiting bile. She goes, I'm just vomiting um, stomach bile. It's, that's no big deal. I'm like, Amy, that is not normal. <laughs> so continued our search, and we were very frustrated about finding anyone who knew anything about this disease, let alone what to do about it. Quickly learned there was very little, um, no medications, no therapies. Um, and uh, about a year later, um, we learned about uh, TPIAT. And at that point, even though um, numerous doctors, including uh, the one that said she was somehow quietly healing herself, um, said it would be malpractice for anyone to do TPIAT, she had only had three stents by that point and um, had not had chronic pancreatitis long enough to be qualified for TPIAT. She said, thank you very much. See you later referred herself to the University of Minnesota, where she was evaluated, and within six weeks had um, a TPIAT surgery. Uh, not before one more scare with possible pancreatic cancer with a mass in her pancreas that thankfully turned out to be benign, and she went through with the TPIAT. However, not knowing that she had chronic pancreatitis for all those years and what we thought was just these uh, Amy being Amy attacks were actually acute pancreatitis attacks. Her pancreas was pretty well destroyed by the time she got to TPIAT, and um, there weren't many healthy islets to transplant into the liver, although they did the very best they could. So Amy is a fully insulin-dependent uh, diabetic, uh, similar to the woman who spoke a few minutes ago. She would say if she was here, that's no big deal. Being a diabetic is a fully manageable disease, and uh, chronic pancreatitis is not. Sure. So that's, that's my daughter's story. Thank uh, you for listening. Thank you for sharing. So um, Dr. Wasif had talked about first-line treatment uh, being uh, enzymes, and you know we've heard about some of the more um, invasive kind of later surgical and other procedures. I wanted to get your experience with that enzyme treatment and if you could describe how that might have helped uh, or uh, your views on, on the role that that played in your pancreatitis progression. So any views or experiences uh, with enzymes? Yes, right here. They're fast. <laughs> my name's Michelle Kanoy. I'm from Indiana. Uh, I had my first incident probably in first grade. And this is my daughter, Hope. Hi, Hope. In first grade, we didn't know what it was. Wasn't diagnosed actually until I was 30 mm -hmm. after I'd had her. With Creon, is with the lipase that I take, okay. for three years I was told we're not even going to try to prescribe it because it's too expensive not even given a chance. When I was prescribed, the insurance I had, it was zero dollars. So physicians, I think, have a worry, a concern, and they just kind of write it off automatically due to the expense. However, if I'd had that opportunity, my chronic pancreatitis might not have gone to the progression that it has. They do help, 
me eat, but I have to balance it out with a dehydration effect. So it's either be severely de dehydrated and be able to eat, or not be able to eat and then be very weak and malnourished. Okay. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Eric, did you have something to add on that? Yes, uh, I'm not enzyme insufficient. Um, so I don't need uh, enzymes for that purpose, but I have taken Creon for a number of years, and I just wanted to comment that I have not seen any discernible effect on the level of pain. Mm -hmm. I know there was a comment in a talk earlier that it can, uh, but it certainly uh, does not help everybody in that respect. Sure. So, oh, yeah, Hillary. Uh, I started taking the enzymes after the Whipple uh, because I did not have pancreatitis prior to the pancreatic cancer, prior to the Whipple. Uh, I didn't know that it was supposed to help with pancreatitis. Once I did start getting the acute pancreatitis, uh, it didn't change anything. Okay, sure, thank you. Okay. So, oh, we'll take another comment from Holly, but I'll also, uh, before you say that, <laughs> sure. uh, broaden it to other treatment approaches that maybe we haven't heard a lot about so far. Again, I know a number have come up repeatedly um, in some of the comments so far, but we'll go to Holly and then we'll take this comment over here. Sure. I don't personally take the enzymes. My mom just recently started. Um, and she's very against this. We'll not have the TPAAT. She was a smoker for all of these years, has the gene and all of that, but she um, then was told she wasn't really a candidate because she has COPD and a lot of other issues she has going on, but she was dead set against taking the enzymes. Dead set, it's not gonna do anything for me, it's doing something I'm not doing it. She started taking it and has seen major progressions, really. She has more energy, she can digest food, she can eat, it doesn't run right through her. She's seen a gain, of, she's gained five pounds in a week almost. I mean, it's been really been life-changing for her. I personally don't take them, I'm not there yet, but and I don't know if you can take them pregnant, that's probably something I should look into, but yeah, it's really helped her a lot. Sure, thank you, Holly. Morton Cole, I'm a caregiver for an 18-year-old. Um, I think it's Eric talked about uh, good good work with the cannabis, and um, my son has a more of a problem more recently with stones, and um, he actually went through pain for nine months, Creon, and everything else under the sun that they could think of to work, and for the most part, all it did was make him nauseous. So um, we went along and we got him a uh, Med Mal card, Med Mal, Med uh, whatever card, and. Um, the cannabis has worked very well. Of course, that's brought along other potential issues as um, not a lot of parents in here probably say, you wanna go get some pot with your son, mm -hmm. but that's the situation we're in. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. So while we're exploring now treatment approaches, I'm gonna ask you guys to pull out your phones again. We're gonna do um, some questions to get an idea of the experience that we have in the room with different treatments. All right, so I know this is a long list, but this is uh, because we know you guys have to juggle a lot of different treatment approaches. So here, please select all of the different things that you're currently doing to help manage the symptoms of pancreatitis. Note that the next question will be asking you about what you've done in the past, but here we're asking you about what you are currently doing. These are uh, uh, good. Thank you for the, the clarifying question again. So anytime we have an uh, opportunity to have you provide more than one response, we're seeing the percentage of responses, not the percentage of individuals that have that experience. So I'm not going to read the, the whole list um, here, but we have quite a few options. Uh, of different things that you have done to help manage your symptoms of pancreatitis. Um, many that we've started to hear about, but some others that we haven't heard about uh, quite yet. All right. So it looks like the uh, leading uh, current approaches to treatment include non-opioid 
uh, pain meds, as well as diet and dietary changes. I think we've heard a little bit about those so far. Um, we just talked about digestive enzymes. Uh, haven't heard much about nausea medication and whether that is at all helpful uh, in managing day-to-day uh, -day nausea symptoms. Um, after that, we hear about opioids and narcotics, another common um, treatment approach that we've heard about. Um, but there's quite a bit of experience in other areas, different lifestyle changes. Um, would be very interested um, if you have one of those to share for you to think about raising your hand, as well as uh, hydration and heating or cooling. Um, I think maybe those are some good ones for us to talk about here in just a minute. Um, but again, a lot of experience with almost every single one here, as well as some others. So um, I wanted to put this up to get you thinking about uh, sharing some of the maybe less common treatment approaches or maybe ones that just aren't as top of mind. Do we have a comment on hydration or heating and cooling? Let's just go down the line real quick. We'll start with Jean. Oh, we all want. Um, so I wanted to mention one thing that I did many years ago, which was part of a research project, and it was a mind-body mind -body program um, that was run by Dr. Benson up at, at B.I. Deaconess Hospital. And it was a six-week program, and we um, learned all sorts of things. Uh, we learned meditation which is very help helpful, journaling. And I remember very clearly going through the whole program. We had to respond after each meeting whether it helped or not and saying, no, it didn't help me. I'm just saying as I wasn't. But the reality is it helped me tremendously because I realized very soon afterwards, which was after the time I was reporting, that it really made a difference. When I had a real flare, if I could you know, bring myself back to that really peaceful place or if I'm having an MRI or if I'm having a procedure, it helps me tremendously. And I, I see other people doing journaling, which is very effective. It doesn't cure the problem, but it helps me deal with it better, and I thought it was very helpful. Um, I just wanted to talk to a couple of different therapies around the nausea medications. I take Compazine three times a day, and then I take a um, nausea medication that's for cancer patients called Amend or Apropentant. Um, it's designed to be taken twice a month. I take it every day, so 30 times a month. So they don't really know the long-term effects of that. I don't know how great that is. But um, it works very well for me. And so um, if you struggle with nausea and the regular kind of Zofran fenagrins don't work for you, I would recommend talking about that. Around heating and cooling. Um, and just how, how well is that uh, regimen of nausea meds working? It works great. Okay. So yeah. I live on that that regimen of nausea medication. And we've tried to cut back the Compazine to twice a day, have to have it three times a day. We tried to go after the TPAIT, we tried to take me off of the amend and that did not work. So, and, um, and when you say great, is that, are you still experiencing nausea at all? No, I don't experience okay. any nausea. Okay. No, and um, very rarely do I vomit anymore. Okay. Now without those medications, I would be back on a feeding tube. Sure. So with those medications, I'm able to eat on my own. Without them, I, I live on a feeding tube. Gotcha. So they enable me to wow. function and eat. Sure. Thank you. Um, for heating and cooling, I travel with my heating pad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is my lifeblood because otherwise I'm just too cold to function. Um, and around anxiety, I do a lot of meditation also. Mm -hmm. Even that picture of like being in the MRI machine, I do a lot of meditation just to kind of get through things and get through pain. And I have a weighted blanket, so it's a gravity blanket mm -hmm. that really helps me stay calm when I'm having a flare or when I'm having pain or anything like that. I've noticed the weighted blanket is actually something that's come in really handy. Wow, thank you, Audrey. Hillary, did you have something to, I saw your hand. Uh, the bathtub is incredible for me when I start to get a flare of pancreatitis. If I there's things that I start have, I have started to do ritually when I start to feel that. Uh, I have a product called Chelidonium Magus. It's a homeopathic medication used for indigestion. Mm -hmm. But somehow, if, if I start to feel the pressure right in my sternum, I take that first. Mm -hmm. uh, there's over-the-counter nausea medicine called Nazine. You can get it at any drugstore. Rather than taking uh, the prescription, I take that first. I take two of those with the Chelidonium Magus and I get in the bathtub. Sometimes I can stave off a full episode if I do that. I can cut it. Um, 
I want to say first, for me, the most important thing is how I choose to deal with all this mentally. If you decide that you're going to get through this, that you need to have a positive attitude to help heal yourself, to get through every day, to be with those around you and not have this become your life, um, you have to have a framework in your mind of how to deal with it. And that's been the most significant part of all of this for me, including the cancer. Wow. So. Thank you. Eric, one more point, and then we're going to go to uh We'll take actually a comment here, and then we'll go to the next polling question. I just want to make one more quick comment about cannabis. Uh, I live in California where it's fully legal, not federally, but, but on a state level, and, and doctors and patients both accept it as, as a completely uh, legitimate option. But I encounter people all the time around the country who kind of mm -hmm. just get a little freaked out by it. And I want to say, it, it doesn't, for me, it does not reduce the pain, but it can easily take me from being in bed, feeling like absolute uh, trash, to being up and walking around. And... It just, as Hillary was saying, it kind of takes away the emotional response to your physical situation from the physical situation. So you may actually say to yourself, wow, I'm really in a, just a notable amount of pain, but it's not taking you down on a daily basis. So um, I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to, but I think it's something, especially compared to opioids, considering it's infinitely safer and has fewer side effects, I think it's something that deserves very serious consideration. And in addition to that, just because of my liver now, I can't take any pain medicine, nor can I take Advil or any of that. So for me, uh, I started using cannabis last year, sure. and that has helped as well. Thank you, Hillary. Yes. Uh, my name's John Mahalchek, and just uh, briefly for my history, uh, I had my first episode of acute pancreatitis in 2006. I was a freshman in college uh, a week before finals uh, when I had my first at attack. Um, in 2009, it switched over to chronic, and then in 2013, I had the total pancreatectomy with auto islet. Uh, and then just recently, in the first week of December, uh, echoing the adhesions, uh, I had a revision surgery um, to take care of adhesions and some other things, um, and I saw some improvement with that. But uh, I was excited to hear about uh, the focus on mental health uh, from the folks in the panel, and that's kind of just what I wanted to echo as well. Um, throughout all of that, um, I definitely, looking back, had underlying depression and didn't realize it. Um, and that's something I was able to start working with a therapist about two years ago. Uh, and that has made, um, like I said, it doesn't help with the pain. It doesn't help with, this, um, with the nausea and those kind of things. Um, but it definitely helps with management. Um, and I'm just excited to hear uh, more focus on um, the mental health aspects. Because uh, I feel like there's a, a stigma associated with that sometimes. And, and patients are reluctant to... Um, to talk about it, but I definitely think that um, that needs to be a, uh, a priority for folks with any chronic illness, but definitely with this as well. Sure. And so for you, that uh, kind of that type of talk therapy has been able to help a lot with that? Yeah, that yeah. And, uh, it takes a low dose antidepressant as well, but um, it definitely, uh, sure. looking back, you know, my therapist, her favorite line is someone going through all this stuff. Um, if you don't have some underlying depression, there's probably something else wrong with you. So <laughs> sure. that's her, her line she gives. So. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing. All right, if we can uh, go to the next polling question. So uh, here we want to uh, understand a little bit about how your uh, treatment regimen has changed over time. So you just told us about what you currently use. Um, but we'd like to get a sense of what you've used in the past but no longer use. And again, please select anything that you've used before but no longer. So while results are trickling in, it looks like the top medication or treatment that you've used in the past but no longer are non-opioid pain medicines. Uh, following that, it looks like uh, endoscopic procedures and digestive enzymes. 
followed by opioids or narcotics, uh, surgeries, uh, and nausea medication, although pretty much every other, well, every other category um, has been used in the past, but not currently. Um, I'd like to hear from anyone that has had an experience where you've stopped using uh, one of these medications or treatments um, because it just wasn't working for you, and that's why you stopped using that. It could be anything on this list. Um, it may not be, or maybe it was because you weren't sure it was working for you, even if it wasn't certain. Yes, come right here. Oh, can we get a microphone? Just for the webcast? Sure. So my son was on the gabapentin for, um, seemed like somewhere between four and seven months, and um, all it was getting him was nauseous, and it wasn't relieving the pain. Mm. So uh, that's how we came upon the medical marijuana suggestion, and we switched that out, and it obviously worked much better. So you, you're saying that in that case, it was a side effect, it was uh, nausea from the medicine, from the gabapentin? Combined with the... Um, it, it wasn't working to relieve the pain either, so there was no upside to it for him. Sure, thank you. Any other experiences where, yes, I see a hand in the back. Hi, I'm Tara. I have a, acute pancreatitis, and I used to live in Portland, Oregon, so I was smoking a lot of cannabis. Mm -hmm. And then my doctor told me that smoking might affect the pancreas as well. So I'm just kind of wondering how you guys use treatment, if it's in the form of edible or smoking, because I was nervous and I removed it from my diet, kind of. Sure. And have you, are you now taking anything? Um, what are you taking for, for pain management now? Uh, I'm a yoga teacher. I was doing yoga before I had pancreatitis, and I kind of fully grasped onto yoga and more um, natural ways of, of healing. Um, after I got my first spout of acute pancreatitis, it's happened twice now, and it's, it has been about four years since my first hospitalization. So it's kind of a treatment process, but it's mostly digestive enzymes, um, meditation, sure. uh, diet restrictions. Sure. I haven't had a drink in four years. And, and how frequent are your acute attacks? Uh, I've only been hospitalized twice, but I do have um, pain outside of going to the hospital. Sure. The times I was hospitalized was like full blown. I was in there for a week or two on just fluids, severe case, yeah. Sure, thank you so much for, oh, did you have something? Yeah, but I, I don't know if anyone had an answer to the Edible sure. slash smoking Just question. Just really quick if <laughs> Eric and Hillary can say what forms they're on. I, I was using uh, the oils and a, and a vape pen. <clears throat> I've since slowed down on that because there's no regulation and I don't want to cause secondary problems until we know more about that. Um, I use a, a PAX. Uh, it's a device that uh, it's it's a, a, a technologically, it's more advanced than most of the devices and uses flour. Um, and edibles is a problem for me because of my digestive system. Okay. So. Eric. I also, I thought that vapes was the healthy way to do it, but it turns out it's not true. Um, there, there are tinctures. Um, and the only thing you have to be careful of is some of them are alcohol based which I think folks like us want to avoid even any risk of. And, but there are ones that are, that are uh, suspended in oil with medium chain triglycerides, which are supposed to not be as bad for you. Thank you. Do you have a comment? Um, okay. Just to provide a point of uh, information for everybody, because I know this is a frequently discussed and poorly understood topic. Um, a lot of folks with pancreatic disease and chronic pancreatitis in particular are wondering whether and how and when to use cannabis as a therapeutic aid or to add to the, to the th treatment that they're receiving. NIDDK, our institute, is also interested in this. We happen to be sponsoring a workshop this July in Pittsburgh which is entitled Pancreatic Pain. One of our faculty speakers at that workshop 
is a, a neurophysiologist from the University of California at Irvine who, in fact, has studied the, the mechanisms of cannabis and how they affect pain responses and pain transmission. The difficulty, as you realize, is just as Eric mentioned, the use of cannabis is legal in some states and not legal in other states, and that has complicated the scientists' ability to gather data about the use of cannabis and the effectiveness of cannabis. And we hope that by virtue of holding workshops like the one that's planned in July and other activities, that we can actually expand the research into this drug. Currently, only the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, is able to sponsor clinical trials or studies that involve cannabis use. But others of us, particularly those of us in the digestive disease division of NIDDK, are obviously very interested in this topic because we realize this may be very important for patients that we're concerned about. So we're, we're pushing the ball down the field, so to speak, from our end, and we're trying to learn more about this through programs such as the workshop that we're gonna put on this summer. Great. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. So I wanna put it out there, we have just one more minute for uh, our first session here today. Of course, we'll have time to pick up the discussion and really you know, the pediatric adult experience I think is uh, in some ways a spectrum. Um, you know, so we'll be able to continue to have this discussion uh, when we come back from break. But any other uh, final experiences with treatments that you've had, whether you've stopped them or are using them currently? Yes, our final comment. My name is Melinda Mulholland Fry, and um, I've had chronic pancreatitis for at least five years um, with acute flare-ups. My story is like everybody else's here. Um, <laughs> so some of the things that um, my doctors have put me on are amtriptyline, um, pantoprazole, um, what else is it, um, Zofran, um, hyoscycamine, and those sorts of things. And um, so they put me on digestive enzymes as well. None of those have been effective for me. So when I have like an acute bout, I mean, you're on the floor, you can't get up. <laughs> um, so the other thing that I'm kind of curious of is there's no medication that seems to um, keep our pancreas intact. Like you have calcifications and atrophy that occurs over time. And so I don't know if there's ever a possibility of anything like that being developed, but. But that would be a priority for it, you. It would be. Yes. Thank That's you. a great comment. Thank you. Thanks.